Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension and Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Karsten Roth. He's with the Wisconsin Ice Cube Particle Astrophysics Center and uh, was born in Hanover, Germany, and went to gymnasium in Hanover, and got his undergraduate degree at the University of Hanover, and a bachelor, excuse me, a master's degree at Purdue University, and his PhD at Purdue. And of course, I always have to point out that Purdue is the French past participle for lost. <laughs> He also did, uh, for his work at Purdue, he worked at the Fermi Lab, which is the French participle for closed. <laughs> uh, then he went on to Penn State, where he joined Ice Cube, and then went to Ohio State. And then he's gone on to Korea, the university there that he will pronounce for us. And now he's back here at UW-Madison on a sabbatical. So I think he has covered four of the, are there 12 universities in the Big Ten? Thir 14, 14. That's why it's called the Big Ten, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I hope you're here to uh, enjoying your time here in Madison. Yeah. The, the lake will freeze over in a couple of months. <laughs> you can go ice Looking fishing. Looking forward to that. <laughs> uh, his talk tonight is on dark matter. Don't be afraid of the dark. And the cool thing is the folks that are doing dark matter research are inviting us to consider October 31st every year, not just as Halloween, but as Dark Matter Day, or as I would like to call it, Dark Matter Night. And so I think it's great to have you here. I know nothing about dark matter. Let's let Karsten tell us all about it. Please join me in welcoming Karsten right here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction. And it's great to see such a large crowd here to, to come out to, and to know. To, to know what uh, dark matter is. And I think I have to disappoint you because even after this talk, you will not know what dark matter is. And the reason <laughs> is that we don't know yet what dark matter is. But the question about dark matter is actually one of the most fundamental questions that we are trying to answer. So since the early ages of humanity, people have been trying to answer the question, what is the world made out of? And we have come a long way, so nowadays we know that everything in this room pretty much is made out of atoms. So, and we can also, we know that the atoms, we can decompose them in smaller particles. So they're made out of protons and neutrons and electrons. And even uh, if you use a particle accelerator, you can break protons and we can find that protons are actually made out of quarks, which are the constituents uh, that, made up, that make up neutrons and, and protons. Now, as we have built ever more powerful telescopes, we also started to observe the universe and we wondered, what is the universe made out of? Is the universe also made out of the same matter that we have here, which we sometimes call the ordinary matter? So ordinary matter are the protons, neutrons, and electrons, and everything that we know about. So is the universe also made out of this ordinary matter? Um, now, as we observed uh, the universe, we came along evidence that actually the majority of matter in the universe is not the ordinary matter that we know of, but it's dark matter. And that's actually why it is so important to answer the question, what is this dark matter? Because in order to understand the universe and to answer the question, what is the world made out of, we have to understand what is dark matter. And we have actually plenty of evidence for dark matter. And I will, during this talk, explain to you uh, what, how do we know about dark matter? What do we know about dark matter? And then I will come to the question, how can we identify the properties of this dark matter? And uh, since this 
series is called Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm actually brought a picture of my lab, which is the Ice Cube Neutrino Telescope located at the Geographic South Pole. And this is actually the laboratory that I work with, I mean, not at, so, so, but I, I've been there a few times, but uh, that's only a few special occasions when we get to go there. And during this talk, I will also explain you uh, why we can use the Ice Cube Neutrino Telescope to look for dark matter and how we have searched for dark matter with Ice Cube. So now, uh, let me begin with my talk. and. Uh, let me give you the overview. So this is basically what I'm going to cover uh, during the next uh, hour here. So this is basically what I also just uh, told you. So let's start um, with the first uh, question. Uh, what do we know about dark matter? So we know from uh, observations that the mass energy content of the universe, which is actually shown on the top right there, um, that the universe is made out of roughly 5% ordinary matter. So these are the protons, neutrons, and electrons. 27% um, dark matter, and then 69% dark energy. And I'm not going to talk about uh, dark energy uh, today, but uh, that's also a, a definitely a very interesting uh, question. Um, so what we know about dark matter is, uh, is maybe that dark matter could be a new particle. And basically, all uh, that we know so far about dark matter comes from the gravitational interaction that it has. And maybe if you're a fan of Star Wars, then you maybe remember this scene where Obi-Wan is trying to find a missing planet in the star charts. And Basically, he, he finds that the gravitational pull is pulling everything in the spot, but there's no star. So he concludes that, well, if the gravitational pull is there, then also a mass must be there. And this kind of resembles also what we know about dark matter. We know everything that we know about dark matter comes basically from its gravitational uh, interaction. Um, so let's go through some of the evidence that we have for dark matter. And uh, let's start with rotation curves or reviewing actually uh, the gravitational law. Um, so you can see a picture here of, of Isaac Newton and his famous uh, gravitational law, uh, which is shown here, which basically shows that F, the force, that uh, exerted between uh, two masses. So in this case, the apple and uh, the earth is given by the two masses and uh, divided by the distance squared times uh, a constant g, which is the uh, gravitational uh, constant. Um, so with this gravitational law, we can also, we can basically describe all the phenomena in our uh, solar system and it can also use this gravitational law to predict how fast a planet has to move around the sun to stay on a circular orbit. And this is actually the plot here on the, on the right side. And um, yeah, so you can basically see that all the planets uh, follow this gravitational uh, or the prediction from the gravitational law. Um, maybe you are you say, think of Pluto, that Pluto is not a planet anymore, but of course also the asteroids and everything else or dwarf planets in our solar system uh, follow the same gravitational law. Now, now we can actually ask, is this gravitational law universally uh, true? So if it works well in our solar system, does it actually work well also to describe the motion of stars in galaxies. So on the bottom right, you see a picture of a galaxy. So this is a large spiral galaxy. And this galaxy consists out of billions of stars. And in, um, in the middle, you have basically a large uh, mass concentration. And the stars are moving around uh, uh, this, uh, this galactic center, basically. And the question we want to ask, well, are the stars in the system 
uh, following the gravitational law. So some of the, uh, or the pioneering work on this actually um, has been done by Vera Rubia, uh, Rubin, <laughs> sorry, and uh, uh, she actually uh, measured the uh, rotational velocities of stars in, uh, in galaxies. Um, she unfortunately passed away uh, just about a year ago, which was very unfortunate because, uh, I mean, of course, <laughs> it's very unfortunate, but her, uh, um, she did very, a lot of the pioneering work on, uh, on this and also found a lot of the evidence for dark matter. And she was also considered for the Nobel Prize. And in particular, given that there are very few women who have won the Nobel Prize, it would have been nice if she also received that. So actually, let's have a look at her work to, to honor her. Um, now, she tried to measure galactic uh, rotation curves. And to measure galactic rotation curves, uh, she used the Doppler effect. So you know uh, the Doppler effect basically from everyday life when you have a, a source of a sound, for example. So let's take uh, this fire truck here. If the fire truck is moving towards you, uh, the sound pitch will, will change then compared to when it's moving away from you. And the same effect is actually present in, in light. So you know uh, that light is also a waves, and these waves actually get shifted if the source is moving away from us or if it's moving uh, towards us. And uh, on the bottom here, you can see an optical spectrum, and you can see some absorption lines in there. And depending if the source is moving away or towards you, you will see that these absorption lines are shifting. And so basically, if a source is moving away from you, it shifts more towards the red. And if it's moving towards you, it shifts towards the blue. So then uh, on the right side, you can see that she looked at uh, galaxies for which we had basically an edge on view. And she then measured basically uh, the color, or she actually looked at specific uh, spectral lines, so at the H alpha line, um, for, from hydrogen. And uh, she uh, then basically uh, could see how much these spectral lines are shifted. So out of this, then she can derive what are actually the rotational velocities in, in this galaxy. So this is a, a result that she found. She actually looked at many different uh, systems, but this is just uh, one example. Uh, so on the right side, uh, you can see uh, as function of the distance from this uh, galactic center, uh, the rotational uh, velocity of the gas and stars in the system. And red is actually what you predict based on the gravitational law. And white is actually what she measured. So you can see that this gravitational curve actually stays pretty much flat, uh, which um, basically indicates that there is more matter there than the luminous matter that we can see in this galaxy. And she did this uh, measurement actually for many different galaxies. This is just some example of, of uh, uh, yeah, some of the measurements that she did. Um, so this is one case where we have found evidence for additional matter that we cannot see. There's also other evidence, for example, through a gravitational lensing. So if you uh, observe large uh, clusters of galaxies, um, as is uh, shown here, and in the back you might have uh, uh, yeah, this, you look at the distant galaxies behind that, you can see that the image can be lensed. And you can see this sort of at, maybe let me see. Uh, where is the point? <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe it doesn't appear. But, but you can sort of see this, this ring shape. And these are actually galaxies behind this uh, galaxy cluster. And they get uh, distorted. 
And this distortion basically is, is based on uh, the bending of the light due to the matter in between. And then we can actually check how much matter do we expect to be in between and uh, how much bending do we actually see. And also from this you can derive uh, that there is additional uh, matter. Um, further evidence uh, for dark matter and actually uh, one of its fundamental properties uh, can be derived from an example uh, which is called the bullet cluster. So this is actually a very a beautiful image um, but it's actually a, a composite image um, that is, is kind of uh, false colors. But let me just explain what you are seeing here. So this is an example where two galaxy clusters, so two clusters of galaxies are uh, colliding. And uh, they, so they are collided and actually pass through each other. And what you can see on here in blue is actually where the mass is distributed. So this is actually from gravitational lensing. Uh, you can obtain a distribution where the mass is located. And in red, you can actually see uh, where the hot gas is. So this is uh, the ordinary matter. So when these galaxy clusters uh, collided, actually a lot of the gas was stripped out and uh, this is left in between while the, uh, most of the, the, the galaxies basically pass through each other. And the matter is uh, basically located at this uh, blue region. Um, now, this actually tells us something about dark matter because uh, we can see from this image that dark matter did not collide with each other but just pass through each other. Uh, so from this we can actually derive this conclusion at the bottom that dark matter does not interact very strongly with matter and also not very strongly with, with itself. Um, other evidence for dark matter um, yeah, uh, comes actually from the structure in the universe. Um, you can actually see uh, a movie up here which is a, a simulation of uh, our universe. And you can actually see how uh, the structure in the universe uh, is forming. Uh, so actually these, these uh, distributions basically shows the distribution of the, the galaxies and uh, matter uh, in, the, in the universe. And you can see that you basically get these, these filaments. So now um, let me actually move on to the next slide. I mean, this actually goes on for quite a bit, the simulation. But if we um, actually look at the distribution of the uh, galaxies in uh, our universe, we can actually find a structure um, that looks like this on the, on the right. And on the left, actually, I have put different simulations uh, of, uh, of dark matter. Um, and I labeled these, uh, well, I used different names, uh, cold, warm, and hot dark matter. So DM stands for, for dark matter here. Um, it actually describes how fast the dark matter particles are moving. So for example, if I think of a very fast moving particle like a photon or light, which moves with the, with the speed of light, um, then I would be in this regime of hot dark matter. And you see that the structure is very smeared out, which means that dark matter cannot be hot and also cannot be warm, but it's, it's cold. And uh, cold basically means that the dark matter is moving very slowly or the dark matter particles are moving very slowly. OK, so then. There's further evidence for dark matter, actually, from imprints to the cosmic microwave background. Maybe let me go uh, quick on this. So this is actually a radiation that's uh, emitted at the very beginning of the universe. And uh, this has been precisely measured, actually, with the uh, Planck satellite. And from this, we can actually derive how much dark matter there is in the, in the universe. 
Now let me uh, move on. Um, so one of the, the last evidence that I want to mention here for uh, dark matter before I go to how we uh, search for dark matter um, is actually evidence that comes from uh, clusters of, of uh, galaxies. So in this image here, <coughs> is the Coma galaxy cluster is shown. So each of these uh, objects here is basically a galaxy. And uh, we can also, again, using this method from Vera Ruber, uh, when uh, she, she looks at the redshift or blue shift of these objects, she can look at the velocity uh, distribution of these objects. And if you assume there's more uh, matter here, then the velocity distribution of these uh, galaxies will be increased. So they will be moving faster. Um, this is just uh, basically what follows from, from gravity. Um, now this is actually uh, when uh, in the 1930s, actually Fritz Zwicky, who is a famous uh, astronomer uh, from Switzerland who worked most of the time at, at Caltech. Uh, he actually <laughs> observed uh, this Coma Galaxy cluster and he found basically the first evidence for this missing matter or how he called it actually dark matter or he spoke German so he so said the dunkle materie, so the dark matter. <laughs> so this is a, a picture of him and uh, the, <laughs> the Coma cluster. <laughs> so since these early days of, of Zwicky, actually, we have learned uh, quite a lot about dark matter. So there's conclusive or there's uh, overwhelming evidence uh, for dark matter on all scales um, in our universe, uh, as I have uh, shown you. But the big question is still, what is this dark matter? So we have seen dark matter through its gravitational effect, mm -hmm. but we want to know what is this dark matter? So let's go try to answer the question, what is dark matter? Now from this observational evidence that I showed you, we can basically derive the following properties. So dark matter is cold, which means it's, it's relative, the particles are relatively slowly moving. Um, it's neutral, um, which means it's not interacting through uh, an electromagnetic interaction. So it doesn't absorb or emit light because if it would emit light or absorb light, then we would have easily seen it. And it's also not very strongly interacting um, with the ordinary matter. Um, so this, for example, we have seen in this example of the bullet cluster where the two uh, galaxy clusters are colliding. And also, is this, this uh, new particle has to be stable, because if it uh, decays, then it's not around anymore. So these are basically the, everything that we, know, that we know about dark matter. So then we can ans uh, ask the question, well, um, is there any particle that we know of that has these properties? Um, so now here I show a, a table of all the particles that we know of. So this is actually the standard model of particle physics. So this is basically what you can find uh, or what has been derived based on, on years and years of, of studies at uh, particle uh, accelerators and colliders. And uh, these are all the particles that we, that we know of and as this, you see on the top right, the Higgs boson, this was basically the last missing particle in this standard model of particle physics. And we think now that, that this is basically complete. So we know all the particles that we expected, we have observed. Um, and we can ask the question, well, is any particle in here, uh, does it have the properties of dark matter? Well, so first we have to ask the question, are those particles stable um, or do they decay? Um, and we can cross out actually a lot of them because most of them actually are very short-lived. So you can only produce them at a collider 
uh, for a very short time and then they decay immediately. Um, also, we said that dark matter does not emit or absorb light, so it's not what we say electromagnetically interacting. So we can ask, okay, which of uh, these particles are electromagnetically interacting, so we can cross those out. Um, so then with this, now we are only with three particles left, which are neutrinos, but neutrinos are actually uh, relativistic particles, so they move with the speed of light. So also we said dark matter should not be relativistic because it should be cold. So we can also cross these out and there's nothing left. So the only conclusion that we can draw, dark matter has to be a new particle. And um, well, it's actually not, not so bad. I mean, to have a new particle, it just enlarges our horizon, maybe it makes the world more interesting if there's a new particle. And there are actually plenty of, of uh, theoretical physicists who have cooked up models uh, that predict, for example, uh, new particles, and just one of them is, is supersymmetry, which you might have heard about, but, uh, and people are looking for that. But there are also many other theories um, that predict uh, new particles. Um, so now, how can we actually look for this new particle? Um, there are basically three different ways how we can search for dark matter. Um, the first one is we can try to produce dark matter. So this is basically recreating the conditions that were present at the very early universe when it was very hot and dense when we expect that dark matter was actually created. So, and we can do this actually at particle uh, accelerators, so this is, or uh, colliders. So, so in this case, we, we collide uh, two particles with very high energy and produce, we can produce new particles. The second way how we can look for dark matter is actually through the scattering of the dark matter particle with ordinary matter. So this is, uh, the, the idea is basically like uh, you're playing pool. If you have an atom and you have a dark matter particle coming in, it could hit the atom in rare cases and maybe give some nuclear recoil. And we can try to detect uh, this interaction of uh, dark matter particles scattering on, uh, on an atom. And uh, the last way uh, we can look for dark matter, what we call dark matter annihilation. So when dark matter interact with each other, it uh, could produce uh, maybe standard model particles which we then can observe. So now let's have a, a quick look at these uh, examples. Uh, the first one, which we call make it. <laughs> so the idea is here that we uh, use two standard model particles that we collide uh, at, at very high kinetic energies, and then uh, use this energy to produce new particles. Now this is uh, being done at the Large Hadron Collider at, at CERN um, near Geneva, uh, Switzerland, and which is basically uh, yeah, 2.7 or no, <laughs> 27 uh, ring uh, circular accelerator in which we collide two protons, and these protons are basically moving with the speed of light and are colliding, and when such a collision happens, um, this is basically shown on the top right here, uh, many particles are created, and out of these uh, many particles that are created, we are trying to find uh, a new particle, and the bottom right is, is Kind of, or bottom left is kind of such an example from kind of a theoretical prediction for some new particles that might be produced there. So uh, analyzing all this data is an uh, incredibly difficult job. And uh, at these experiments, which is, for example, shown here, the uh, CMS uh, detectors, there are really thousands of people working on this and sorting through all this data. And after sorting through all the data, they have found basically no evidence for uh, a new particle. 
I mean, they have found the Higgs boson, so there's something, but <laughs> there's uh, no, no dark matter or no physics beyond the standard model, as we say. Um, now, the second uh, way how we can look for dark matter is to look for an interaction of dark matter uh, with uh, ordinary matter. And this is uh, what I call here, shake it. <laughs> so basically shake the, the ordinary matter. And actually outside here, uh, you, can, you can find a, a booth actually by Kim Palladino. <laughs> so she's sitting over there and later on she can, uh, since she is working on, on this dark matter direct detection, she can later also explain you more about this. But here I just want to give you uh, the basic idea so the basic idea is that this new particle, which I denoted by this Greek letter chi here, is just hitting an uh, ordinary atom and depositing some energy, and we are trying to uh, detect this, this small energy deposition. Um, this is incredibly difficult to do um, because we know that dark matter is very rarely interacting. So to run these experiments, you actually have to go deep underground to be away from any, uh, any backgrounds. Um, so yeah, so later on, please check out uh, the booth outside. <laughs> okay, and then the last way, and this is actually the way that I mostly look for dark matter is through indirect searches for dark matter. So in this case, we assume that two dark matter particles uh, hit each other, and uh, in this process, standard model particles are created. And those particles we then are trying to observe. Um, this is actually the basic idea here. Um, on the top left here, you can see these two dark matter particles, or we call this uh, yeah, WIMP dark matter here, weakly interacting massive particle, are hitting each other and then are producing some standard model particles. And at the end, uh, you go through some decay chains, but at the end, basically, we can find uh, stable particles that we can observe, like light or um, yeah, neutrinos or uh, some antimatter, and there are different uh, experiments that are trying to look uh, for this, for this, uh, uh, or indirectly search for these signals. Now, let me—I uh, cannot <laughs> go over all of them, so let me just uh, pick the experiment that I'm working on, which is the Ice Cube uh, Neutrino Telescope. So this is actually a picture. Um, taken at the, at the South Pole. So this is actually the counting house where uh, all our electronics are uh, located for this uh, experiment. Um, now, why uh, have we constructed an experiment at the South Pole? Now, uh, IceCube is a neutrino telescope. And in order to detect uh, neutrinos, um, we need to make uh, use of an effect which is called uh, Schrenkov light. Uh, so this is actually when a neutrino uh, interacts, um, it produces um, some relativistic particles which then uh, send out some Schrenkov light. And this is actually uh, a picture of Schrenkov light. Um, this is actually taken uh, in a nuclear reactor and in a nuclear reactor, you have also some relativistic particles produced that uh, pass through the water. And when they pass through the water, they send out this uh, shrink of light. And basically, we are trying to detect the same light, uh, but when a neutrino interacts um, with the ice. Now, the, mm, now in order to detect um, this, this light, uh, we need a detector medium that has very good optical properties. So that's why actually we decided to build the detector at the South Pole because we can, at the geographic South Pole, the ice is roughly uh, two miles thick and uh, has very good optical properties. So that's why uh, we decided to build an neutrino detector there. Um, so then the idea uh, to detect 
neutrinos through the Cherenkov light emission uh, can be explained in this following cartoon here. Um, so you have a neutrino and uh, that's coming in on the bottom uh, right here. It's interacting, uh, producing a particle which I call uh, a muon here. <laughs> so, and uh, this muon uh, is basically like a heavy electron. And uh, when these neutrinos interact, in particular a high energy neutrino, it, uh, it produces a very energetic muon and this muon can actually travel uh, several miles. And when it travels uh, through the ice, it sends out a cone of this uh, Schrenkov light. So all that we need now is a precisely timed optical sensor array. And with pre this precisely timed optical sensor array, we can then uh, detect the Schrenkov light and reconstruct where the neutrino came from. Now this is a simulation here that actually shows this effect. So this, uh, what you can see here are different uh, strings, uh, different strings of optical uh, sensor modules and uh, this, uh, an energetic uh, muon passing through this detector. Let me actually show this uh, again. And as it um, passes through the detector, um, you see this uh, shrink of light that's uh, emitted and whenever this light gets detected by one of the optical sensor modules, we mark this by one of these uh, colored balls here, which basically indicates uh, the, the, the time actually when uh, the optical module was hit. And the size of these blobs basically indicate uh, how much light was detected there. Now, uh, this IceCube uh, neutrino telescope is actually a, a multi-purpose experiment. It basically serves many different uh, um, science or physics cases. Um, and uh, basically we are uh, trying to look for neutrinos of astrophysical origin. Um, we're trying to study cosmic rays, atmospheric neutrinos, <coughs> even glaciology, trying to understand the ice, and also uh, look for dark matter. And of course, uh, IceCube is headquartered here at UW-Madison, so uh, maybe some of you know already a bit about it. So it's a very exciting experiment. And um, it's actually a very large uh, international collaboration also. So there are about 300 uh, people working on the experiment from all around uh, the world. Um, from 12 different uh, countries, and all the countries are, are shown uh, here. Um, this is actually a picture of the uh, South Pole where our experiment is located. This is actually a South Pole marker. Um, this, this marker actually stands where the geographic South Pole is. And you can, if, if you read on there, you can actually read this January 1st, 2008. So this is actually uh, at the time when, when I was there, <laughs> so I took that, uh, that picture. Um, this is actually, yeah, some, some image of me there. <laughs> so at that time, uh, the, the gray in the beard is actually the frost, but <laughs> now it <laughs> became real, so it's, uh, time has, has passed on. <laughs> so <laughs> Okay, so then the uh, detector, um, is located very close to the um, geographic South Pole. Um, the, uh, you, you can see basically on the uh, top right there a map of Antarctica and where the geographic South Pole is, is located. And uh, on the, um, yeah, basically you can see there uh, where the geographic South Pole is and also uh, where the Amundsen uh, Scott South Pole station is. So this is actually where. Uh, the scientists uh, live. Um, <laughs> then there's a ski way. This is actually where we used to, or where planes come in to bring in uh, supplies and scientists and uh, to, to work there. <laughs> and then very close uh, to this um, station is actually where the Ice Cube uh, Neutrino Telescope is, is located. And on the uh, top left, you can see actually a, a temperature chart. And I haven't 
seen any any winters here in Madison yet, but I hear that <laughs> during this time here in, in November, uh, uh, December, the, we go to yeah maybe minus uh, 30 degrees at the South Pole, so maybe we, we reach this temperature here also. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you can see from this temperature profile then in, in the Austro summer um, or Austro winter period it actually goes down to minus uh, 70 or so uh, or even below that. And the ice cube detector was actually constructed uh, during this period uh, from November till February. So that's actually when the South Pole is uh, accessible. Um, so after that, uh, the uh, station basically uh, is, is not accessible and only a few people stay behind to keep the detector running. Um, this was actually on this picture here, the, the guy in the middle, uh, Tech, uh, he was actually one of our winter overs who stayed there one entire year to keep the uh, detector running. So <laughs> they are doing a tremendous uh, job actually. Okay, so um, on the yeah, bottom right, uh, you can see kind of this footprint where the Ice Cube Neutrino Telescope is uh, located. Um, now let's actually go below the surface to see how the detector looks like. And um, you can see here uh, the, in the schematic view how the detector looks like. So first of all, the, the ice is roughly three kilometers deep and uh, we have used uh, a hot water drill to drill holes into this ice um, to a depth of 2.5 kilometers and then uh, deploy it uh, optical sensor module. So in the bottom right, you can see actually such an optical sensor module. So it's basically kind of this uh, kind of uh, basketball size <laughs> uh, module uh, that contains uh, a PMT or photomultiplier tube, basically a large uh, light sensor. And with that, we want to detect the light from a neutrinos that are interacting uh, in the eyes. Um, then this detector was built over a period of, of seven years and uh, has been taking data since uh, 2011, ever since. Actually, already during the construction period, we uh, obtained many uh, very useful um, science uh, data. Okay, this is uh, how the detector would look like if you could float through the, through the ice. Um, these are actually the optical sensor uh, modules. Uh, so it's basically at the bottom you can see this large uh, optical or, or this large uh, PMT and then on the top uh, it's basically just some uh, electronics that digitizes the, the signal that's received by this optical sensor module. Okay, so then how do we look uh, for dark matter with this uh, neutrino telescope? Well, one of the uh, most spectacular ways actually how to look for dark matter with ice cube or very unique ways is actually to look for dark matter that's captured in the sun. Um, this is actually, uh, it sounds at the beginning quite out of this world <laughs> that this would be possible, but it's actually uh, a very reliable way to look for dark matter. And the idea is here that you have um, dark matter particles from uh, the galactic dark matter halo. Uh, so as we said earlier, the galaxies are engulfed in, in dark matter. Uh, so these individual particles uh, could uh, scatter eventually on uh, or, or with a hydrogen atom uh, in the sun. When this uh, scattering happens, they can lose some energy and they can become gravitationally bound to the sun. And this is basically what's shown here in this pink line. So you have a particle that's bound to the sun and or this dark matter particle and it will uh, maybe this orbit brings it uh, through the sun and it has a higher chance of interacting again. It will lose more energy and eventually you sink to the center of the sun. So if this process happens over millions of years, we basically accumulate in the center of the sun 
a dark matter. <laughs> and, uh, and when you have an enriched region of dark matter, eventually it will also interact with each other. And when it interacts, it can produce um, the standard model particles. Now, from all these particles that are produced in the center of the sun, there are basically no particles that could make it out. Only neutrinos are the only particles that uh, can make it out of the sun. So neutrino, I should mention, are also called the, the ghost particles because they, they interact so rarely. So they can, they can make it out of the sun and then come to the Earth. And if we uh, detect such a neutrino with the ice cube detector and see that the signal points back to the center of the sun, then this is a smoking gun signal for uh, dark matter. Now we have uh, performed uh, such a search, um, actually several searches. This is actually some results from uh, the scientific uh, papers that we, we have written on this. Um, basically on the bottom left, you can see uh, we are basically uh, counting the number of neutrinos that we observed in direction of the sun. And this is actually what's shown in these uh, black dots here. And this gray band um, is actually, maybe just look at the, yeah, one of this, this bottom region here. So, and this gray band is actually uh, what uh, we expect from a background, so from neutrinos that are naturally produced in the Earth's atmosphere. And you can see that this gray band, which is kind of the natural background, um, is basically flat, and the, the dots that we observe are pretty much just scattered around that, which means we don't see any excess of events or any additional neutrinos coming uh, from the center of the sun. So. Uh, which is unfortunate, which means we, we have not uh, seen any dark matter um, that's, that's captured in the sun. Um, otherwise, also, if we would have seen it, you for sure would have heard about it already. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the bottom right uh, is actually the uh, results plot. So this actually shows um, in, on the x-axis so on the horizontal axis, uh, you have the, the mass of the dark matter particle. And on the vertical axis is basically the uh, interaction cross-section, or how strong this dark matter particle would interact with ordinary matter. And um, this red line at the, at the bottom this is actually the result uh, from the Ice Cube Neutrino Telescope. So it actually shows that the Ice Cube uh, results are very uh, relevant. So also uh, on there are shown some other experiments. And you can see that the Ice Cube actually has some of the strongest uh, bounds on dark matter. So we, we have not found dark matter, but uh, we can still um, exclude some parameter space, which is then uh, important for theorists who are creating models um, for dark matter um, to, to know kind of where there is no dark matter. <laughs> so, so these uh, searches are actually yeah, very, very important. Um, there are many other ways also um, how we have searched uh, for indirectly for dark matter. So we have looked for dark matter annihilation in our galaxy, uh, in the galactic center, in uh, small galaxies, in galaxy clusters, and all those, um, we have not uh, found any, any evidence uh, for dark matter. And similar, also other observatories um, observing with gamma rays, or um, they have not found any, any evidence for, for dark matter. Now, one of the things, um, that we have, however, seen um, with IceCube recently is we observed very high energy neutrinos. Um, this is actually uh, following this and also the completion of, of the IceCube neutrino telescope. Um, we have also won this uh, breakthrough of the year from uh, physics world. And this is actually a very 
um, big or important discovery because for the first time we have observed energetic neutrinos from, uh, yeah, from of extra uh, terrestrial origin. So they are somewhere from, from outer space. <laughs> and uh, we still don't know where these neutrinos are coming from. Uh, so these neutrinos have humongous energies, so they actually have energies much higher than the energies that are created, for example, at the uh, LHC, at the particle accelerator. Um, uh, basically, a thousand times uh, higher in energy are these uh, neutrinos, or some of the neutrinos that we have observed. And the big question is, where are these neutrinos coming from? Um, so there are some natural or astrophysical sources, source candidates like gamma ray bursts, active galactic nuclei, um, but also people have suggested maybe there's some new physics, so it could also be so we're also looking if these high-energy neutrino flux has any exotic origin or origin from, from dark matter. So, Okay, so with that, actually I've come to the end, and so let me conclude. So first of all, um, we know that most of the universe is uh, made out of dark matter, so there's overwhelming evidence for the existence of dark matter. And I've showed you at the beginning of this uh, talk the different ways how we have found the, the evidence for the existence of dark matter. So for example, in uh, large-scale structure of the universe, um, galactic uh, rotation curves uh, through gravitational lensing, uh, cosmic microwave background, and so on. So there's overwhelming evidence for the existence of dark matter on all scales in the universe. And we tend to believe that this uh, dark matter is a new type of matter that we have, uh, and uh, yeah, a new type of matter, and we have found or we have identified certain properties of it. So it has to be stable, it's non-baryonic, not very strongly interacting, uh, it's also not uh, absorbing or emitting light, and uh, yeah, it's stable and not decaying. And to understand the universe, really, uh, we have to understand or we have to learn what dark matter is. And this why is such an important, uh, um, such, uh, yeah, that's why it's so important to look uh, for dark matter. And all these, uh, there are intensive efforts now ongoing by searches at particle accelerators uh, indirectly through looking for the annihilation of dark matter and uh, directly looking for the scattering of dark matter uh, with nuclei. And through all these searches, we have, uh, we were able to already exclude some of the models that have been proposed uh, to explain dark matter, but there's still uh, plenty of parameter space out there to explore, and really we have to find dark matter to understand uh, the universe and to answer the most, uh, well, one of the, our most fundamental questions, what is the world made out of? And so I hope you enjoyed this, this talk, and also please remember October 31st, uh, Halloween? <laughs> no, no, it's the dark matter day. So at that time you can you can learn more about dark matter. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>